This war was inevitable, unfortunately. There was never a diplomatic solution here, sadly. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to agree with you because as a diplomat, I hate to say it. But so we need to use this very small uh, window of opportunity of time yeah. to uh, end this war. Otherwise, it may become endless. <laughs> Hello. Our guest this week on The Edge is Ambassador Volodymyr Yelchenko. And the ambassador lies at the intersection of some of the most important relationships that Ukraine has, whether that is at the United Nations or as the ambassador for Ukraine in the United States of America. Um, ambassador Yelchenko uh, was a, a key uh, eyewitness and participant in some of the most important events uh, in the lead up to this war and uh, during the extended period of this conflict. He was even the last Ukrainian uh, ambassador to be posted to Moscow. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for coming and spending some time with us here on On the Edge. And I want to start with your expertise and your knowledge of um, diplomacy. What What is your... Um, uh, what is your kind of take on the repercussions on the diplomatic stage for Russia having launched this war in Ukraine? Well, it's a difficult uh, question, actually. I think I think that uh, this war was inevitable, unfortunately. I had my own feelings uh, around the end of 2013, when I was still ambassador in Moscow, uh, when the problem started to arrive with Vilnius mm -hmm. summit, non-signing by Yanukovych uh, mm -hmm. EU association agreement. And then Yanukovych uh, at least uh, two or three times between the very end of uh, 2013 mm -hmm. and uh, uh, early 2014, he was traveling to Moscow and to Sochi to attend the opening and closing ceremonies of the Olympic games. And I could see in his eyes uh, that that he he already felt that the problem is coming, the real big problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, for me, it meant that he heard something from Putin already, which which made him, you know, nervous. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, when when Maidan started, and everything started to fall apart. Uh, 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 inside Ukraine, uh, Putin just uh, took this chance to start conquering Crimea and then starting the war in Donbass. But still, between 2014 and 2022, I didn't have the feeling that, that Putin will go as far as to start the real war against Ukraine. Yeah, or war. try to forcibly overthrow the government in Kiev. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But... Uh, as I already mentioned to you, my feeling is that Putin just felt at some point of time that he would not be able to persuade President Zelensky after Zelensky's uh, uh, election uh, to go what I call the Belarusian way. Mm. So peaceful, you know, taking of Ukraine. Creation of a puppet government. Yeah, yeah uniting it, it Ukraine with... Turns this, Zelensky into Lukashenko. Yeah, union state with Belarus, Ukraine, probably Kazakhstan, something like that, or, or Eurasian Union or Customs Union, and stuff like that. And, and when he realized... Uh, well, first of all, it could not happen during Poroshenko presidency. That was no. clear, absolutely. But I think Putin just waited, and he had some some hopes that, that Zelensky would become a totally different figure, I mean, different from Poroshenko. And uh, he will allow this sort of peaceful, uh, you know, bringing Ukraine back to Russia peacefully. Or I, I think also he, want, he, he thought he could manipulate Zelensky. 
Yes, um, at least you I, I, And I spoke, and, and on Zelensky's side of the equation, I, I, I had the good fortune to speak with former Ambassador Bill Taylor here in, in Kiev, and he said in his discussions with Zelensky that despite the fact that Zelensky had been brought in, uh, to, had been elected on a plan to try and negotiate with Moscow, that um, according to Ambassador Taylor, mm-hmm. uh, so I'm getting this, you know, Zelensky to Taylor to me, uh, is is that President Zelensky quickly realized that there was no reciprocal mm-hmm. feeling from Moscow that there this should be negotiated peacefully that that Putin had mm-hmm. aggressive designs yeah. on Ukraine either as you say by turning Zelensky into Lukashenko which I think he quickly learned he couldn't do yeah. or by force I mean does that Absolutely. coordinate with what yeah. you yeah, saw yeah. that 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 that's what I mean and uh, well you know. Uh, uh, some people say, not some people, but you know, serious uh, experts say or used to say that uh, uh, Putin acted uh, based on the false recommendations from the security service, mm-hmm. from the army, from intelligence mm-hmm. of Russia that uh, uh, they would be able to, you know, conquer Ukraine very quickly, Kiev for th- in four days and three days, whatever. And uh, uh, the problem was that uh, I don't know why why this information uh, or why why the Secret Service of Russia really believed that uh, you, you know the situation is like this in Ukraine uh, because they certainly had a lot of you know connections, a lot of people in Ukraine sure. and the former opposition in the parliament sure. and and stuff like that. But if you just live in Ukraine like me, or mm-hmm. like you now, mm-hmm. and you just talk to people in mm-hmm. Kiev, in any small village in Ukraine, very quickly you realize that this is totally different Ukraine no, I, from what it used to be 25 years ago, or even 10 years ago. I think they delude themselves, willfully. I think they have a, there's something about yeah. them in their sense of empire, yeah. and and the, and their perspective of, of Ukraine as a, as a, just a, a colony, as a part of mm-hmm. you know Mala Russia, a little little Russia, yeah. you know that they there's a mental block where they can't hear the voices of Ukrainians saying no, mm-hmm. we want to be different, we want to be independent. Yeah, probably you're right, but we're we're talking about serious expertise. Oh, I know, but I mean it, the, the mistakes the, like I think that. The deception goes that deep that it is so deeply ingrained that even people who are serious people mm-hmm. have a fundamental. They and upon which they build all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. you know. So I don't think this was ever going to happen. Uh, as much as I'm sure you you made all the efforts that you possibly could in the run up to Maidan or in your other diplomatic efforts, um, because this is one of the reasons why I want to talk to you is because you you're kind of at this nexus point of Russia, U.S. and and the UN. You've mm. you've seen it all. Yeah. You've been at all of those areas, and I I think. There's a, a misperception that this this war could have been avoided diplomatically, and then subsequently, of course, you know the story. I'm sure of this narrative that Moscow puts out about Boris Johnson's trip in, I guess it was April or something yeah, some, uh, yeah. of of 2022, uh, yeah. right after the right after Bucha was discovered. You yeah. know, so the idea that that that. Johnson would come with any kind of negotiated deal that would be rece- received mm-hmm. welcomely, you know, w- would be welcomed in Kiev right after Bucha had happened, I think is is fantastical. But I, I, you know, there was never a diplomatic solution here, sadly. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to agree with you because as a diplomat, I hate to say it, but but because this, <laughs> Nobody I mean, wants during all my life, all, all my career as a as a diplomat, I was trying you know, to come mm-hmm. diplomatic solution in in every case, but 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 here you are absolutely right that uh, it was uh, well the war was uh, I I will tell you this uh, even back uh, I, I remember well my last meeting with the uh, uh, embassy staff in Moscow when I was about to to be recalled. Or you know physically you know go from Moscow to Kiev and and since then there was no Ukrainian ambassador there was Shanja Defer number two and now 
the embassy, just empty. There's no embassy. But that was during the closing ceremony of the Olympic Games in Sochi, Winter Olympic Games. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, uh, and then a couple of days after that, uh, the uh, the situation in Crimea be, uh, began to, to deteriorate and, you know, green man and, mm-hmm. and uh, Russian soldiers so fast, uh, so on. And, and, and uh, 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 during the day when the Russian parliament took a decision to annex Crimea, I, I met for the last time with my staff in embassy and I told them one thing I remember well that, guys, mm-hmm. This is only the beginning of the huge problem. Yeah. Although I didn't believe that the real war or the full-scale war would start at the end of February 2022, or the big invasion, and uh, I was really surprised that 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 Putin did decide to go as far as as you know just starting to kill Ukrainians and yeah, and, and, yeah. And, but back in 2014, I think I think you're right. I mean, though, we could pay it, we could see it coming when yeah, I was yeah, here. Yeah. How, it was only the matter of of time. Yeah, it was, sooner and, and or later, how, and how and methodology and, and things how, like that. Yeah. During your time in 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 Moscow, you must have gotten to know the the Russian diplomatic corps very yeah. well, very closely. The minister of the the foreign ministry. What was your impression of them then, and what do you think of them now? I'm, I'm and notably, of course, Sergei Lavrov or, or or Peskov. I don't know Peskov. I've had interactions with Lavrov and uh, Zakharova, um, but not Peskov. And to my mind, they were completely different before the war as to what they are now. I mean, Lavrov to me seems to almost be a shadow of his former self. Uh, Zakharova we've seen uh, in press conference, notably the one, the borscht press conference where she Mm. gave her mother's borscht recipe and politely it seemed to be she was a little bit impaired. Потому что нельзя было делиться борщом. Ну нельзя. Он должен был принадлежать только кому-то одному. Вот только кому um, what, what was your impression of them then, and what's your impression of them now that you're looking, obviously now from afar, but I, I, I how's ag- this war affected them? I, I would agree that uh, it, it looks like, like we are dealing with a totally different people or persons, yeah. Yeah. and it, I just cannot get it. I mean, I don't understand why, because I used to know, and I, 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 I've spent a lot of years working well not not together but in the same you know delegations mm-hmm. uh, UN sure. Security Council mm-hmm. you know Russian uh, uh, embassies uh, foreign ministry in Moscow New York Washington mm-hmm. and and uh, I couldn't imagine that that people may change mm-hmm. so quickly and so dramatically yeah. especially when you uh, are talking about a person of like 55, 60, 65 years old. Mm-hmm. You can change uh, the mentality of, of of the younger person, but you cannot really change so quickly the mind of a person who is 60 years old yeah. with all his, you know, diplomatic... Uh, uh, and he was one of the experience. greats. He was... Yeah, yeah. I have two... I have two Sergei Lavrov stories that I tell. Um, and it, it, it exemplifies to me what a, just, he was at one point, he was probably one of the world's best diplomats. He, he outmaneuvered, there was nobody on the Western side of the equation on the, in the diplomatic right. corps that he, right. he ran circles around Kerry. He ran circles around, you know, the French, the, the Brits. I was at, I was in Geneva. With for the um, the so called Iran nuke talks, the, mm. the build up over a year basically, so a series of talks. And um, L- Lavrov, uh, the two stories I tell one is from a colleague of mine who was rushing to get to a, a, an appointment, and he was uh, he came off the lift, he came out, out of the elevator, and he was rushing and he ran out of the elevator, not realizing that the Russian delegation was, was about to get into the lift, mm. and he stepped on Sergei Lavrov's foot. Mm. Mm. And he, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And he describes it as a icy stare of death. He said, Lavrov looked at him and he said, I'm so sorry, Mr. Lavrov. I'm so sorry. He said, yes, you are. <laughs> and then got into the lift. I mean, that's Sergei yeah. Lavrov. That's the, yeah, yeah. this kind of sharp kind of 
And then the other story I tell uh, from this same period of time, this year of interaction in Geneva, was one time we were all sat, the press corps was waiting for the departure of the delegation, the various delegations after a day of talks. And we're sitting there, we're sitting there, we're sitting there. And then suddenly the entire Western um, delegations, all the diplom diplomatic uh, group teams from the Western nations came racing out of the of the conference room at the Intercontinental Hotel, got in their town cars or their, or their you know taxi limousines or whatever their security cars, and raced away. Something obviously had happened. Lavrov, with uh, Maria Zakharova in tow, come out calmly as could be, just cool as a, cool as cool can be. Walked into the hotel bar, which had been closed, in you know. Uh, uh, instructed the, the hotel staff to reopen the bar and he sat there having a double scotch with Maria just like the cat who'd had the cream you know just mm -hmm. this was the kind of Sergei Lavrov that I knew that I witnessed firsthand and I now see him pushed to the side I see him relegated to a very secondary role within Russia he was once you know very close to Vladimir Putin uh, he does not seem to be anywhere near as close as he used to be. Again, you know, we're seeing this disintegration of the Russian diplomatic corps. You know, it it says to me that that there's a lot of pressure on them. Um, yes, and hey, you know, the Russian foreign ministry. Well, you're right. I, I remember the times when uh, when uh, uh, any any major international issue uh, was taken care by. Russian foreign minister first, and then, well, of course, like in any other country, you should uh, have a confirmation of your position from the very upper level, from the presidential administration of, of Russia or prime minister, whatever. But still, uh, Russian foreign minister at some point of time in the 90s, at the beginning of, the, well, let's say, before 2010, if approximately they used to have a, what we call the, the a free hand so they had some liberty in um, you know elaborating the position so Putin would of give Russia. them a, a long leash yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, it all stopped sometime after 2010 they like you said they turned into sort of second-hand, uh, you know, diplomatic service. Uh, yeah, they don't have a liberty to uh, work out the positions of Russia on, on any uh, international issue. Mm -hmm. The example I will give you, uh, when I was uh, ambassador to the United Nations for the second time, between 2015 to... 2019. At that time, uh, at least for two years, we were sitting together with the Russian Federation in the UN Security Council. And uh, when you sit, especially when you have this, uh, what they call closed consultations, very narrow circle of, of like ambassador plus one, 15 people in the very small room, and you can see some you know, documents, you can see what they, or you can hear what they talk to each other. And uh, I suddenly realized that uh, they just read out everything received from Moscow, which was not the case before. Before, yeah. Lavrov, as you said, he, he used to be a very good speaker. He spoke like, you know, two, three, four languages. Uh, he could deliver the statement just without any preparation, uh, yeah. just from his head. <laughs> But now, when you look at the Russian ambassador at the United Nations Security Council, he is just, you know, reading the text. Uh, he is not even, uh, well, he doesn't look up. He is afraid to uh, skip, you know, any, you know, comma or letter yeah. or word from the text which was written uh, in the Kremlin, not, not even in the foreign minister of Russia. Yeah, so, written in the Kremlin, sent over to to, to the you yeah. know, ministry down down there on, yeah, on yeah. the the on the circle. That that yeah. that's why that's why you notice that uh, the, probably uh, the Russian diplomats they don't have any influence whatsoever 
on the things which which yeah, happen. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because I wanted to ask you uh, how and and maybe they don't have the um, the autonomy that they used to have, but the 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 product is still the same in many ways. When you were at the UN, explain to us. How is it that the Russians act as kind of spoilers at the UN? They're very, they're, 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 you know, they have a reputation at the UN. It's my understanding of being mm-hmm. very divisive. Yeah, uh, at, right. at the General Assembly, but then at the Security Council. Can you tell how do they kind of manipulate um, the United Nations? You know, they just say things with the open uh, eyes, uh, things which which you first uh, don't don't even understand or realize that, I mean, total bullshit. <laughs> Sorry for this word. No, it's uh, it's but, appropriate. <laughs> yeah, but they uh, say it again and again, mm-hmm. and then it looks like they themselves mm-hmm. start to believe in what they say, because yeah. I don't think that Nibenza, the current Russian ambassador to the UN and to Security Council, mm-hmm. when he says about those... Uh, uh, you know, military mosquitoes, which are growing up in Ukraine. With the genetics yeah, that or, poison the... De- yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, the white is black, the black is white. Like, or, it's Orwell style. But, and, and then you realize that uh, they are starting to believe themselves in what they say. Yes. And, uh, you know, people around the Security Council table, they just laugh at them. But it doesn't change anything. No, they just continue saying stupid things, uh, and not only uh, about Ukraine. No, about they, everything. About, about everything. everything. Yes, you're, they lie. They lie. Consistent. You're totally right, saying that uh, they're very divisive in the UN. Uh, uh, you know, they're just uh, probably copying the behavior of the former Soviet Union or former yes. Soviet Union diplomacy, which used to do the same. Yes. To call black white and white black and mm-hmm. stuff like that, uh, with, with not the intention of proving their point, but rather with the intention of destabilizing yeah, the yeah. rules based order. Yes, um, and and uh, uh, they are clever enough. Russian delegation in the UN is, is famous for uh, their knowledge of the rules of procedure, technical this details, is the thing. small this things. This is the thing. You're right. Nobody else. Yeah, here's what no I've Americans, not the Brits. They they cannot. It doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't. It, they they will say yeah. whatever they want to, yeah. um, and they they know you're right. They know the rules back and forth. But what I find very interesting, when it comes to how they interact on the global stage, when they when they scream about the rules and the laws mm-hmm. and international laws and who's in violation of what international law, when at home domestically, they don't believe in law. Yeah. They, there is no law in mm-hmm. Russia. There is power. In Russia. Yeah. So they don't believe in this idea and they're being disingenuous. It is my opinion. They are being disingenuous on the global stage by using rules and law, not because they genuinely believe in it, but that they could, they know that it is a mechanism to sow yeah. disorder yeah. globally and for them to exert their influence. I wonder if that gels with uh, what you saw. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I think the same. Uh, I mean, they don't care yeah. about the laws. They no, they care about using the laws yeah. and, you to know, mess uh, with everybody. You know, this knowledge and get their way. This uh, best knowledge and good expertise helps them a, a lot to manipulate. <laughs> it's so and, cynical. And, it's so cynical. Yeah. And the second thing, what they do, they are very clever in in, in using their puppets in the United Nations, mm. like you know, Cubans, Syrians, Iranians, you know, Venezuelans. Some you know small well Belarus of course sure and, and some other at some point Armenia for example mm-hmm. or even Kazakhstan they're proxies they're yeah, proxies, proxies no, yeah but uh, you know they're some, clients some of them are closer to them some are not as close as as the others but but still they have this group of approximately ten to twelve countries uh, the bad guys mm. uh, we used to call them uh, and uh, you know in the UN everything. Uh, when you have this stupid consensus rule in the General Assembly, for mm-hmm. example, yeah, yeah. T- uh, yeah, you may need uh, only two or three countries which will spoil everything. They will come against 185 and yeah. they will spoil and kill any decision. And of course, in the Security Council, they just, I mean, Russians, they're just using their right of veto. 
yeah. to kill anything which is going against their own interests. But what I think they've what what I think they underestimated when it came to this war and to initiating this this imperialist land grab, um, you know, uh, you could say what you want about Western powers and their exertion of their imperial power, but nobody's been tried to annex a neighbor in quite some time. That that's what the whole post World War II world was all about. They've tried to grab by force of arms a, a neighbor's territory, and so. I don't think they expected the reaction from the international community because they, they're they all about being divisive. They want to divide and conquer. And what they have done by invading Ukraine is they've unified the West in a way that I have not seen in my lifetime, really. I mean, the European Union was always kind of fractured. It was always a, a, a very loose union of people, you know, everybody pursuing their own little national interests. Mm -hmm. But they have they have unified. But, you know, NATO, after being very uh, hammered at for quite some time, has come back together under the leadership of President Biden. Um, and, and NATO is now, you know, got new members and is more unified than it has ever been. Do you think um, that this the, the war... Uh, took them by surprise and did the exact opposite of what they had hoped to do, which was to sow division. And instead, they now are facing a very unified world that is standing against them. I mean, they have very few friends now. Yes. Well, you know, I think that, uh, or I would say it this way, uh, um, uh, I think that the decision to go for war against Ukraine was Putin's Biggest mistake because, of course, he in his entire presidency. Yeah, he 100%. he couldn't even imagine that the war would take so much time, effort, and and killings. He hoped to take Ukraine, if not in two three days, but you know probably in six months. And then it would be a done deal. And, and then it, it, and would, it, it would, yeah. it would, like in Georgia in two thousand and eight. Yeah. Once it was, it was done. It was already. Or like with Crimea. Yes, I mean, once uh, it's accomplished, you can. Uh, people aren't going I mean, to fight you, for it. But yeah, if it's you still may a like question, it or not, but 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 Crimea question. Uh, well, it was not totally forgotten after like ten years of occupation by Russia. But it was, you know, uh, coming to the second, third, seventh, twelfth place in people's priorities and and inevitably at some point of time i wouldn't say that crimea would be totally forgotten but it would become like you know cyprus issue or middle east issue mm -hmm. 70 Something's years always of conflict, in the background something, or even like uh, the uh, the the irish issue uh, irish uh, issue the, the, yeah. the troubles or it's always in the background or the 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 story about uh, non recognition by the united states uh, uh, of the baltic states uh, you know occupied by the soviet union yes uh, it took 52 or 58 years until the soviet union uh, collapsed and and the Baltics became independent again. So something like that would have happened to Crimea. But when the big war started in Ukraine mm. or the big aggression started, then of course you're right, the West realized that uh, something very dangerous was coming, yeah. something real. Yeah, I think he, he overplayed his hand. Yeah. He, uh, they overplayed and and uh, they made this mistake. Now, as as we speak, the Russian uh, losses uh, in Ukraine uh, come closer to half million. Yeah, it's like yeah. four hundred ninety-seven. Yeah, it will soon be five hundred thousand. Only five hundred thousand mm -hmm. killed or wounded, whatever. This is huge. I mean, yeah. This figure is huge, but. And 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 I don't I don't really think what what else Putin can can use in order to uh, to return the situation in his favor. I don't I don't see anything, uh, with the exception of using nuclear weapons, of course. But yeah. that would mean the end of the world. Yeah, and, and even if it was a limited exchange, it would be the end of Vladimir Putin yeah, because yeah, yeah. So he, this is not the be, option. Even the Chinese, yeah. that they would turn against him. Yeah. All the rest of it. This is not the option. Let me ask you a question about your time as ambassador to the United States in Washington D.C. When you were there, what was the what was the most difficult thing that you had to explain to your counterparts at the State Department about 
the conflict here in Ukraine? What was what when you went and sat down with somebody from state or maybe the Pentagon or the White House? What was the most difficult for thing for you to explain to an American um, delegation about what was happening here and who who and what Ukraine is and why they're fighting? Uh, you know, you you may be surprised by my answer, but it was already about weapons. That was before the big invasion, but that was the time when we, uh, I myself negotiated uh, the delivery of, of the very first, uh, uh, you know, battleships to Ukraine from Baltimore, like mm-hmm. island type, they say. Like yeah, patrol, frigates. They uh, were, they were, they patrol, were patrol boats, coastal patrol. guard yeah, yeah, something kind like of thing. Protect, okay. protect Ukraine's yeah, uh, yeah. waters, territorial and, waters. And it worked. Uh, uh, it uh, it has become a very uh, relevant issue, especially after this uh, uh, the, the tragic uh, tragic uh, um, accident or incident uh, in the Kerch Strait when two Ukrainian ships yes. were taken by Russians and uh, some people were killed and taken hostages. Yes, I and at, at that time, uh, Americans realized that they need to give something to Ukraine in order to strengthen at least this you know, border control part of, uh, but of course it was before the the big invasion. And then at that time, I, I started talking, uh, well, of course, upon instruction from the Minister of Defense of Ukraine and the presidential administration about uh, patriots. Mm-hmm. Even then, some people in Ukraine started to think about the need to strengthen the air defense as well. Of course, mm-hmm. nobody expected such an invasion at that time because that was like like two years before. Um, uh, but it was it was all you you were having conversations with your counterparts in the United States about weaponry, about weaponry, about, yeah, about yeah. defense. That was both with Pentagon was, and with did State you Department. never did did you ever get a pushback from state uh, in particular, or maybe the president's office of, you know, can you not find a way to you know, live with 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 Russia. Did they ever try and influence you? Not really. No, not really. So they Maybe understood. It, they yeah, understood yeah. that Russia understood. was a, a a serious threat. Yes, then and, and wasn't but, yeah, wasn't but, going to be resolved no. with a talk. But but uh, they were sort of, uh, in my opinion, too slow mm. in, in coming to this realization. For fear of Russia or not so, an uh, understanding of Ukraine's maybe needs? Maybe for fear of Russia, maybe uh, because of this, you know, traditional uh, school of thought. The, I uh, I used to call it the old guard. People in the State Department and uh, yeah, in the White House and uh, not even, uh, not in Pentagon. Uh, and in some think tanks, especially in Washington, mm-hmm. D.C., uh, old school, like uh, like Fiona Hill, for example, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. people who used to 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 study in Russia, who used to work in yes, the, I know the type. in American embassy for sure. years, ambassadors, mm-hmm. uh, younger diplomats, yep. so they still had this, you know, uh, knowledge of the former Soviet Union. Uh, Ooh, is it nice, romanticized? Uh, yeah, well, they, <laughs> kind of idea you know, like perestroika yes. and razryatka right. and, and the, stuff the, like the, that. The time, that period, that very th- th- thin window of time where yeah, there was a yeah, hope that maybe yeah. Russia and the Western world could find some sort of... Yes. And, uh, and, and, if not friendship, then association. Yeah, and also many of them... Well, that uh, lasted about still, that long. <laughs> yeah. Many of, of the same people still have this uh, belief that yes. uh, they they could still bring back Russia at least to the situation of uh, of the 90s, like yeah. Yeltsin presidency, yeah. a lot of hopes for democracy and, you know, things like that. And I was trying to, to tell them that, look, we are living close to Russia for like 70 years. I myself spent, you know, the first half of my career uh, as a Soviet citizen. And I know them better than you. Don't tell me that you can still, you know, talk them into in, into something. Yeah. They yeah. are not... I could name they, names, but I'm... Yeah, they, <laughs> they are not people you think of. They yes, are, you're romantic. You're thinking about your, your, your 20s, your 30s, whatever it was when you were... Uh, visiting and traveling yeah, and living yeah. in this very different Russia, this very 
from its entire history, there was this period of the post-Soviet, this way, and I suspect, although none of us are old enough, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, to remember, you know, and because it's past our living lifetime, but I'm sure there was a window of opportunity in the post-Czarist empire, where before, yeah, before the Bolsheviks, this, there, there's, there's, there are these little isolated incidents in Russia where they, they might have had a chance to make some fundamental changes and, and be, uh, you know, a functioning yeah, partner yeah, on the global yeah. stage. Yes, but you're right. They always revert back to. You're their... right. It happened uh, in um, you, well, in between uh, 1970, yeah, uh, 1915, 1920. 19, yeah. Then, then the very short when there period, was an actual Duma. With yes. some power. Then and again, then it, uh, well, they reverted. They the always very, reverted. Uh, you know, the very early uh, weeks and months after the victory in the Second World War, it was also kind of, uh, you uh, know, uh, before the Cold War started. moment in time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then, of course, the beginning of the 90s. Yeah, and, I remember and, that's and when I was living in Moscow. Yep. But, uh, you know, they... So they, you they, ran into these people who kind of had this perception of Russia as a potential, you know, normal... Yeah, quote, uh, yeah. quote, whatever that means, country. More, more and, than and that, it, it wasn't realistic. It was based on this kind of flowery idea of when they yeah. when they lived. In, uh, in more than Russia. that, I still that uh, at least some of those people are still there. Yes, uh, I know they're still around. <laughs> That's why you hear recently this, uh, you know, uh, kind of relatively new topic of or fresh topic about the uh, non-use of of U.S. weapons against Russian territory. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can imagine some of those people I talked to who would come to President Biden and say, no, 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 we cannot do the, We cannot allow Ukrainian to use because this is the end of the world. This is the beginning of the nuclear war. This is the red line, whatever. Okay. Although I don't think that uh, there are uh, any red lines left. The I only would, one is I would, I would tend to probably agree. nuclear weapons, yes, but, but... But again, if they use nukes, it's, as we discussed we're earlier, in a completely yeah, different world. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, conversely, as you were ambassador to the United States, what, what do you now, coming back to Ukraine, have difficulty explaining to your Ukrainian colleagues and friends and, you know, people in the, in the diplomatic corps here in Ukraine or, or just average Ukrainian citizens? Because I hear, I hear very often... Uh, frustration and confusion and anxiety expressed from the Ukrainian people when they look at America and, and America's support for them and how kind of you almost have to, you know, drag help out of the Americans when on the other side of the equation. So you've explained to me what you as the, the ambassador mm -hmm. to America for Ukraine, we're having to explain to your American counterparts. What is it coming back to Ukraine and going, well, you, no, this is what you have to understand about America. What, what are you saying to your fellow uh, Ukrainians? You know, this is a relatively easy question because I, I, I used to answer it quite, quite often. Uh, my personal strong belief based on my more than 40 years of diplomatic experience and half of it uh, I spent in the United States in, in one capacity either in the UN and yeah. New York or and DC, I think yes. I know Americans well I understand <laughs> okay. them well all right um, all right yeah. all right uh, give yeah. it to me yeah <laughs> and I I used to say all the time once and again that there's no better friend of Ukraine than the United States by the way this is not uh, my phrase this is a uh, phrase belonged to Nikki Haley I've heard this phrase from her during one of the meetings in the Security Council uh, about Ukraine, of course, and it came so so deeply in my mind. I'm still repeating this phrase uh, uh, because I believe in it, in that. But unfortunately, when you say it to some Ukrainians, they would say, "No, no, 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 no." They give us uh, not enough weapons. They are you know, letting us down here and there. I say, "Look, you have to be frank with them." I mean, if you want to be liked by Americans, you have to show that you are the real friend because Americans need you also some, from time to time. Mm -hmm. You are voting some, you know, issues. Uh, yes, and this is the second thing which I'm, uh, I'm, I'm saying all the time. Because I hear uh, from time to time here, even during uh, the war, that, look, why uh, Americans are not investing money in Ukraine? Mm. 
not enough. I say, mm. but look, guys, you have to sort out those issues because the the U.S. investors don't trust uh, in Ukraine. Yeah, because we have these issues. Well, the corruption issues, corruption the, yeah, issues, no, corruption issues, yeah, yeah, absolutely. which will never change as long as Moscow is, yeah. is, is and, running and, things and here, only, which is kind of part of what yeah, this war and is Only about. then you would become the real friend of the United yeah. States. And I think that I, I do, if I can just provide some of my perspective, having come here for 25 years, I think that will happen. I, I, I yeah. think that when the war is over, there is going to be a very uh, strong uh, emphasis on – anti-corruption efforts. They are already happening now, but it's going to yeah. increase because Ukraine will be uh, looking for uh, joining the international community, both the Europeans, but also the West and, and America. Yeah. I, I know that they want to have good relations. That's why right behind you there, I have the statue for the motherland yeah, right, right next to the right next to the, the beacon from the Statue of Liberty. So and you know, uh, that, that's on purpose. Coming you know? back to the issue of corruption, which I hate. Oh, me too. Totally. I know. But uh, it is a reality, however. Yeah, but but when I talk to some Ukrainians and they say, "Look, look, why Americans, uh, you know, criticize us so much about corruption? They have corruption in the United States as well. So why should they tell us? I said, look, guys, <laughs> this is not the same. Different. It's, yeah, not, it's not, not the same. same. It's not, not the same. same. <laughs> not the same at all. Uh, yeah, uh, corruption here, sadly, as a result, I I would argue, although I don't I don't take away the responsibility for. Ukrainians as well for this, but I, I, I do see the influence of Russia's way of life yeah. and its kleptocracy. Yes. That is not just Putin's kleptocracy. This is, you know, this is his. This is Russia's history. This is, is, is yeah, corruption, absolutely. and absolutely. and much of the influence of of Moscow here in Ukraine has led to that corruption. Um, not to yeah. absolve of Ukraine. It's like so. cancer. It is. It's like a cancer, and it's also like the water in which you swim. Yeah. It's it's just it's mm. everywhere. You know, it's it's, and hopefully we can. You know, I am confident that the, that change will be made, uh, because not least, aside from the fact that Ukraine wants to be a, a partner, um, and and wants to be allied, I I I'm very pro American general sentiment that I feel mm -hmm. here, despite all the criticism and the and the, and the anxiety and the and the frustration with us. I genuinely do think that most Ukrainians do look upon America favorably. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, yeah. let's yeah, let's course, hope let's hope that we can improve. But certainly, obviously, we have to get to to, to a victory in the war first. Now, in, in conclusion, Mr. Ambassador, and I, I have said previously uh, about this podcast that I don't intend to make this podcast about kind of um, the 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 news of the day. Um, but it is a historical record, so I want to take this moment in time. We are filming about a month before a planned, um, uh, what is being called a, a peace meeting uh, or a diplomatic meeting, perhaps, at Lake Lucerne in, in Switzerland. Uh, approximately 50 nations will be attending. Uh, President Zelensky will be there. The Russians will not be um, at, at Time of, time of recording, the Russians are not invited, but the, the organizers have said that's because Russia's not interested. They're not they're not being, you know, they're, they have shown no inclination to coming to the team. So it seems to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that this seems to be the West gathering to talk about possible um, uni preventing, presenting a unified front on the diplomatic stage to Russia when the military situation, you know, when we start to move towards diplomacy, as all wars will end with diplomacy, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that they can then have a unified front when they when they go to Moscow, when honest um, and and you know sincere uh, peace negotiations begin. Um, that's my take on it, but I'm I'm I would be interested in in your input with your years of expertise. Um, what can we what can we, can we realistically expect to come out of the Lucerne meeting? I think that uh, uh, one should not expect any immediate solution. This is uh, actually, if you look back into history and you have those uh, Middle East peace conferences, Bosnia peace conference, uh, Dayton, uh, ultimately uh, Dayton, Dayton, some other things, uh, uh, Avram records. Uh, uh, on Israel and, and, and other stuff. When you look at all this, uh, you realize that uh, any, any big international event uh, has to have some stages. Mm -hmm. So the Swiss conference or the Swiss summit is only the 
not very first, but one of the very first, uh, uh, you know, stages in this long process of coming to peace yeah. or ending the war, at least initially. Uh, why? Because we need to have more and more countries from the global south on board. Mm -hmm. We cannot live uh, endlessly with only NATO EU plus platform. By plus, I mean countries like Japan, Australia, mm -hmm. South Korea, whatever, some, some Latin American countries. We need to have some big guys there, like China, like India, Brazil, South Africa, Egypt, uh, you know, Mozambique, Angola, Indonesia. The BRICS, BRICS nations, which are ostensibly yeah, yeah. Uh, not allied. But, yeah, which is know, not happening as Russia. quickly uh, as we want. Some mm -hmm. of those countries are still on the Russian side. Some are... I call it like uh, positively neutral. They are. Uh, would it, would they, like India be on that? Yeah, they they they, they 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 would agree that uh, uh, that Russia is not right invading Ukraine, but but still. But still, it's a it's a yeah. large country with yeah, yeah. you know we can't ignore it and we can't isolate you know, it. The good indication is that uh, Prime Minister Modi of India is planning to come to this summit. Mm -hmm. Probably his decision will push some others to go. Because, you know, India uh, is sort of is trying to counterbalance everything uh, with China. Mm -hmm. They're, yes, not, yes, they're yes. not enemies, but they're not friends, of course. And right. if Modi goes there, then uh, Mr. C will start thinking of, look, this is not good if Modi goes and I don't, or at least my foreign minister doesn't go there. So we'll but see. But if we get these these either BRICS or these the 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 the, um, the other countries uh, that you reference there uh, on board in Lucerne to to come to some sort of agreement or a statement yeah. that they then can be presented to Vladimir Putin. Yes. And and here Is that comes the best we can hope from Lucerne. Right. Uh, here comes my 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 second thought that uh, I think that those who are working out uh, the outcome of this uh, Lucerne conference uh, they made a very clever decision they picked up not all 10 or more points of the so-called Ukrainian peace plan. Because some of them are very much political, some of them about compensation by Russia to Ukraine after the war, about the punishment of the war criminals, things the which, return of the children, which, yeah, the, which, the uh, reimbursement for the damages. Yeah. So what what they decided to pick up and to focus on during the conference are only three, four, five points: nuclear security, mm -hmm. uh, freedom of navigation in the Black Sea, and globally. Mm -hmm. Uh, humanitarian issues among those uh, are children return and uh, the, the swap uh, of, of prisoners of war, mm -hmm. all for all, mm -hmm. and, uh, and food security. So yeah. these are the issues which are very attractive to the global south. What about country. borders, though? I mean, at one point, do we talk about borders? Uh, we're, no, you know, we're nowhere I, near that. I don't think, well, I don't know. I'm not a part of, 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 no, of preparations. No, uh, uh, well, certainly, we can uh, find out that when the conference starts, uh, well, inevitably, in the statements, uh, uh, many countries will talk about borders and sovereignty mm -hmm. and integrity of Ukraine and you know, other things, but uh, the uh, points I mentioned uh, are something uh, easier to get agreement on. Yeah, than the actual. Yeah. Well, it's because, sad, because as you said rightly, we need, uh, or they, the participants of the conference, need to create some platform with which uh, they can come to Putin and say, look, Putin, here we come, and here are the points. And you need to agree with those. Otherwise, you will get more sanctions. You will get this and that. And, so. yeah, and the so, international yeah. community will stand against yeah. you. So sadly, I guess what that means is there's still more fighting yeah. that will need to be done. And actual, you know, possession of territory is, is going to be, you know, that will have to be reflected at another time we, you can address the issues that you brought up but but when it comes to who holds what territory it's still yeah, going to yeah, have to be yeah. done with so probably armed, this armed confident, a confrontation probably Sadly. Uh, you know the, those issues will come as a second stage 
during you know, the second you know, conference or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, but that's, but. That's uh, unfortunate. And I guess lastly, to, to draw a conclusion to our lovely conversation, and thank you for coming, is reflecting on um, diplomacy uh, in the lead up and in the conduct of both the post two thousand the, the 2014-2022 period in when, when the war was kind of isolated uh, and Crimea and Donbass. But as you reflect on where diplomacy started, um, when it comes to an almost inevitable conflict between these two nations. And then you go into how, you know, things have progressed during the actual armed conflict and then forecasting further because all wars do end with diplomacy. That arc, um, when you reflect on how diplomacy has, has either worked or not worked, um, you know, what, what is your reflection on that? I think, uh, allow me just, you know, to pick up one thing on both sides. Uh, one well, on either extreme. One positive of, and, we, yeah, and one negative. Sure. The positive is certainly that uh, we were able to create this sort of, uh, you know, coalition of support of Ukraine. And it comes to weapons, it comes to weaponry, uh, financial aid, uh, humanitarian assistance, and many, many other things. So we have this very strong uh, core coalition, mostly European and Western nations, of course, but Japan also and some others, South Korea, uh, which uh, certainly saved Ukraine. Otherwise, I don't think we would be able to survive the, for more than two years already. The negative uh, thing is that we were not able to make this coalition uh, universal. It still does not have countries like India, China, or mm. Indonesia, or Vietnam, whatever, Arab countries. Yes, there are some who who are more helpful, like Saudi Arabia, for example, or, or Modi from India is coming to the Swiss conference, which is a good indication of the, of the change. Uh, but still, it's not universal. Yeah. And when you take uh, uh, any UN General Assembly decision on Ukraine, taken recently, uh, uh, although some of them uh, uh, had 143, 145 votes in favor, but there are 193 UN members. And among those 143, there's no India, no China, no South Africa. They, is that they, because they are not voting thing? against, but... Uh, is it because of their, their association with Moscow, or is it because Ukraine and the West has not properly made made those countries aware that it would be better for them to stand I think that uh, was with the rest of the world you know yeah. both I think uh, uh, we probably needed to be more more forthcoming with them and and our partners our allies uh, especially those who have much more influence on those countries like United Kingdom for example in Africa or France mm -hmm. Francophone Africa or Spain in Latin America mm -hmm. uh, probably they would need to be more active and, and uh, you know, persuading those countries mm -hmm. who are not willing to, uh, even if they're not on the Russian side, but they're not very much willing, you know, to be in the middle of this, you know, big guys are fighting like mm -hmm. the, uh, Russia is fighting against NATO or US Russia. And they just don't want to be part of it. They don't want to take sides clearly. Right. But I think the, it's uh, it's the matter of talking, of arguments, of uh, of knowledge, and uh, there is still a lot of work ahead. And I mean, uh, both Ukrainian uh, diplomats and politicians um, uh, and members of the parliament and their colleagues from the West. Are you? Are you? You have any cause for optimism for 
a diplomatic resolution, which ultimately will have to happen. But yes, I think I think we still have chances to end this war uh, sooner than later. Uh, at the same time, my only fear is that if you take any major conflict in the world during the last eighty years after the Second World War, uh, you will see that all of them or almost all of them are becoming uh, so-called frozen. Mm -hmm. And if you are not able to unfreeze them or end them in five to seven, maximum 10 years, they're becoming endless. Yeah. Middle East, uh, uh, issue of Palestine, Northern Cyprus, Transnistria. The only exception uh, is surprisingly Nagorno-Karabakh. Mm. But why? Because Azerbaijan just took it back militarily. Yeah. And not diplomatically. So sadly, there, are, there has to be a military victory, which will mean lots more death and destruction, no matter what happens. Yeah. Um, or a real emphasis on a, a diplomatic, you know, solution that will need the involvement of the entire globe. Yeah. Or potentially we fall into a forever war. Yes, because we are coming closer and closer to this, uh, you know, time limit. Mm. Seven, eight, ten years. Yeah. Uh, because when you talk about uh, a war in Ukraine or Russian aggression against Ukraine, you should start counting from 2014. So it's already ten years. Yeah. And this is it. This is the... Uh, the uh, period of time when things may become, you know, fatigue, and I, I don't think and that everybody just will just conflict. will just forget about Ukraine in one day. But uh, this tendency will will become bigger and bigger with every coming year. So we need to use this very small uh, window of opportunity of time yeah. to uh, end this war. Otherwise, it may become endless. Uh, militarily, diplomatically, or otherwise. Whatever. So we, fall, we fall into a, a background war that just is part of life. Yeah. Oof. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's hope we have a resolution. We need to be more optimistic. Yeah. I, I'm with you, and I am optimistic. I think that, I think that either um, through the, the, the strength and courage of the Ukrainian armed forces and the Ukrainian people... Um, or through international pressure on the Kremlin, one way or the other, uh, we, we, we can find a solution to this war. So thank you for your time today, Mr. Ambassador, for coming on uh, On the Edge. It's very much appreciated. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.